This episode is brought to you by Space, supportive parents for anxious childhood emotions. Space is a program for parents with children and adolescents who experience anxiety, OCD, and related problems. Go to neurodiversity.university for details and to register. And that multiple hurdle approach to testing is, is, is another one. I could get into the weeds on testing if you wanted to, but that multiple, you're like, oh, if you, you know, you qualified on this. So now you get to go to the next one and then you have to qualify on that. And then you have to qualify on that. It's, it's like, why do we put up multiple hurdles before we can serve a kid based on their needs? Parenting gifted kids. On the one hand, parenting is parenting and every kid is different. But on the other hand, there are definitely facets of raising gifted children that don't quite fit into the typical parenting paradigm. What do parents need to know about their gifted children? How does understanding their unique needs help us support them? Today, I'm joined by my friend, Dr. Ed Amond, and we're talking about the newly revised A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children, a resource for caregivers and advocates, which includes me as a co-author. That's straight ahead on episode 164. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. So one thing I know is that we're all just trying to feel our way through this whole neurodiversity thing. If you're a parent, you're trying to figure out your kids and know what's best for them. Counselors, we're all just trying to figure out how to get inside the heads of our clients. And teachers, not only are you under huge pressure to hit certain marks, but you're asked to get all of your students to the same, often poorly defined finish line. I used to be a teacher, so I know how hard it is. And as the mother of three neurodivergent kids, these are the reasons that we started this podcast and why we've now started the Neurodiversity University. So then we had to decide where to start. And the teacher struggle was weighing heaviest on my mind. So we built our first courses to help teachers understand neurodivergent students better. Our first course is to help with twice exceptional students. And a second is a course about dyslexic students. If you're a teacher and want to know more about 2E or dyslexic students, why not check it out? And we've made one change. You can now take the 2E modules individually, so you can pick and choose the subjects that you need the most help with. There's a link in the show notes that'll take you to all the information you need, and you can get started right away. Before we launch into my conversation with Dr. Ed Amond, just a quick heads up that you can order a copy of A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children with a special discount code. Check the show notes for details. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Change is a, is a brave act. People become remarkably comfortable in their level of discomfort if they just sit in it long enough. I think there's definitely a coping aspect to that that comes into play. And we have to say, okay, if we're helping someone cope with something in the process of change or in the process of just experiencing their world, that has value. And I think more often than not, rather than solving your problem, is learning how to be aware and learning how to be able to tolerate frustration as part of the human experience. And I think that's something that we actually do very little of culturally these days, less so um, than maybe was present when, when I was a kid, for sure. That's episode 154. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today, I am happy to welcome Dr. Edward Amond back to the podcast. Ed is a clinical psychologist specializing in working with gifted children and teens, and he is also the author of the newly revised A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children, a resource for caregivers and advocates, which I should mention also includes me as a co-author. So, Ed, I'm excited to talk to you today as we get ready to finally launch this new revision of the book into the world. Indeed. Really happy to be here to talk about it. Uh, It's been a long time coming, so we're really happy to to be able to announce this. I don't know if I've ever told you this or not, but when I was actually first making the transition from teaching in the schools to my practice as a therapist, I was trying to find some ways to network and connect with parents of gifted kids in the area. And I actually used and still have 
a copy of my original copy of A Parent's Guide as a resource for that book study that I led. So being invited to be a co-author on the revision a little over a decade after I originally used it in that context is kind of a pretty cool experience for me. But (laughs) I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the history of the original version of the book. Well, I'm happy to. I I couldn't... uh... I uh, couldn't think of anybody who'd be better to to join in the in the process of writing. So we're we're glad to have you on board. Oh, thanks! <laughs> it was awesome. Um, so as uh, as you probably know, Jim Webb uh, was my mentor. Uh, he and I uh, started working together oh, more than three decades ago at Wright State University. And when he uh, decided that w- the 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 field needed a a very comprehensive resource for parents uh, and wanted to write A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children, which wasn't named that at the time. We went through lots of different names. He invited me and uh, his wife, Jan Gore, and Arlene DeVries to put this together. And we started out just kind of conceptualizing what we wanted to do. And it took us a while to get there, uh, but we put that out in 2007 and uh, it was uh, you know fairly well received. So we were happy about that. And it was a, it was a long book. Jim's background as a researcher kind of took over a little bit, and uh, so it's pretty thick. And um, and and one of the one of the things we heard is kind of like it's it's almost like drinking like drinking from a fire hose. It's a lot, a lot of information in a short amount of time. And so um, we set out, I think, as we talked about on this version, is to to kind of streamline some of it, make it a little bit uh, easier to digest, and not quite so overwhelming for some parents. This is the first time I've ever worked on any type of revision. I've never obviously revised any of my own books. Going through someone else's words and works and trying to update and change was interesting and difficult. It was, it was much harder than I thought it was going to be um, because you're pulling from all these different places. But I know that that book was such a, a seminal text within the field of gifted ed because it really has become very influential most people, when they think about what text they have, you know, this is probably one that's on their shelf if they've been in the gifted ed field for any amount of time. For sure. It's been historically used for the Sang model parent groups. And so that helped get it into a lot of parents' hands as well. Um, but professionals as well, I think, found it very helpful for themselves and then for for parents especially to support their kids. But you're you're right. Going back to the process of revising it, you know, it was interesting even for me because it's been so long since the original version was written. Now, let's be honest, we we theoretically started to revise this book several years ago. And then there's a small thing called a pandemic that hit in the middle and kind of slowed everything down uh, as we were all just trying to trying to survive, keep our practices afloat and do all those kinds of things. But revising was interesting because as I was going back going, well, I actually said that. Do we, why do, do we mean to say that that way? Um, and can we say it better? Is there a better way to do that? So yeah, it was very interesting. And, and all the while for me, there's Jim in my ear going, yeah, I didn't let you cut that the last time. You can't cut it this time, you know. So um, you're you're not taking that out. Um, but once we were able to really get into the process, I think that it. I felt like we worked pretty well together to to streamline it and and, and get a lot done. I think that that your strengths um, uh, really complemented the work that I was able to do. So it's also just realizing how much the world has changed. I mean, it was published in 2007. So obviously it was written before 2007 primarily. What are some of the biggest changes in our world or within what we understand about giftedness? Do you feel were the most important things that needed to be updated or changed? First and foremost, the information on twice exceptional and neurodiverse uh, individuals has just, just neurodiversity itself has just exploded. That, that was not hardly even on the radar. And yes, we talked about twice exceptional, but the chapter that was in the first edition was short, mm-hmm. simple, was basic. Um, and it represented a fair amount of the information that was out there at the time, uh, that we wrote it, but there just wasn't as much. So that's one of the biggest pieces, the biggest change overall that, you know, there probably isn't anything from that first chapter that's, or from the first edition chapter on Twice Exceptional, it's even still there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very, very minimal stuff Um, because so much new information, so much more information is out there. Um, That's one of the biggest, uh, I think, looking at, you know, updating information on stress and perfectionism, uh, updating information on depression and anxiety, those things. Um, And really uh, the last piece that, um, that we added in there a little bit on 
managing discipline around social media yeah. and technology. Those are the kind of the biggest changes that we've seen over the years and that I felt like we needed to address. When you look back on your own parenting journey and parenting gifted kids, what were some of the lessons that you've learned? Like, were there some things that you thought would be really hard that ended up not being such an issue or things that you thought would be like a breeze and then ended up being really <laughs> much more difficult? That's a great question. And I tell the story very frequently when uh, when I was president of the, of the Kentucky Association for Gifted Education uh, is when uh, my wife was pregnant with our first and all the the rest of the cage board uh, was older, more seasoned educators. And they were all like, oh, you're, you've been working with parents for a while now. You're going to see what this is really like, parenting a gifted kid. And and I and I joked. I was like, no, no, no. You know what? Just give me a good solid 120. You know, smart kid. <laughs> I can teach him good work habits and we'll, we'll be good. Um, but it has definitely been a journey uh, since then. So my kids were uh, very little when that first edition was being written. So I was up anyway late at night, uh, so I might as well do some writing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they were very little, and, and now they're, they're both in college. One will be finishing this year, and one will be uh, – one has started this, this past year. And so, yeah, what have I learned? Wow, I am so much better uh, as a psychologist than I was then. It, it, it certainly adds a perspective – um, that you, you otherwise can't have. Right. Looking at parenting, yes, uh, you know, the theory works well. And, you know, one of the things that I tell parents very frequently is I don't recommend things to you that I couldn't do as a parent, mm -hmm. which I didn't do before I had kids because I didn't know I couldn't do them. But, you know, gold standard, you know, behavioral uh, chore charts and sticker charts and things like that, they work 100% of the time in the lab, but they don't work 100% of the time at home because we as parents can't follow through with that stuff. And so I don't recommend, you know, sticker charts for all these things because I know I can't do it. I can't expect you to do it, yeah. you know? So it just gives that a, a different perspective. And so that has really changed. Right. I look back now to when I first started teaching and parents would ask me advice about things and I would do the best that I could. And I look back now, I'm like, oh, they should not have listened to me. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I thought I knew something. And then you have your own kids and it's different. It's just a different viewpoint and understanding. And I think also there's a big part of being a parent of a gifted kid or a twice exceptional kid that leans into advocacy and how we support our kids. And it's hard as a parent to advocate for your own kids. It's so much easier for me as a clinician or as an educator to go in and advocate for somebody else's kids. But when it's my kids, there's so much more emotion involved. It just takes on a different a different feeling. It, it does. And it, what I will say, though, is that it also helps having had that experience of trying to advocate for your child, mm. knowing that you are considered by some an expert in the field and still coming up against a brick wall. <laughs> while you're trying to get services for your kids lends a lot of perspective. And, and, you know, if those of us who have some expertise in the field of gifted can't get the services we need for our kids, how difficult does that make it for parents who are not experts in the field going in trying to advocate for their kids? It is really a difficult process. And, you know, and those, those, those roadblocks are real. Yeah, my my sister-in-law, my niece is young. She's in early elementary school and she was just assessed for their gifted identification process in their district. And so they did like the NNAT, which is just a common universal screening tool um, that a lot of schools use. And so she scored really highly on that. And then they gave her the KBIT, which is the Kaufman Brief Intelligence Test. So that's like a really short, a shorter version. And based on those two things, they go perhaps go on to the next round of testing. There was a big discrepancy between those two scores, which was interesting. And so originally the letter said that they didn't qualify to go on. And my sister-in-law will tell me, she goes, well, because I know you, though, I knew to at least ask the question. And when I asked the question, they realized, oh, yeah, we can go ahead and move her through, even though maybe it doesn't quite fit, like there wasn't that roadblock. But she would never have known to ask, just like you're talking about it. And it's hard when parents don't know what they don't know. And I think that's part of the important point of this book is that we want parents to have the tools to support their kids that they really need. Yes, indeed. Uh, and that's such a common issue is, oh, didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You know, we needed a 126 and we got a 125 mm -hmm. or we needed a 130 and we got a 110. 
you know, there's a big difference there. Um, and, and that multiple hurdle approach to testing is, is, is another one. I could get into the weeds on testing if you wanted to, but that's probably for another day. <laughs> um, but, but that multiple, like, oh, if you, you know, you qualified on this. So now you get to go to the next one and then you have to qualify on that. And then you have to qualify on that. It's, it's like, why do we put up multiple hurdles before we can serve a kid based on their needs? Yeah. I mean, it comes down to resources. It comes down to a lot of those things, but I think And I believe always that educators want to do what is best for kids. I think they want to help, but they just don't always know how to work within or change the system, you know, to make some of those changes. And teachers have such a difficult job anyway. Right. I mean, even if we didn't throw in gifted and other special needs kids, um, they have such a challenging job and it's becoming more challenging every day uh, with the world that we live in right now. And, And so... And there are many, you're absolutely right, that want to help, that want to uh, support gifted learners and twice exceptional learners, but they don't they, they don't have the, the the energy, the time, the resources right. or um, the support in some cases from from the administration. More in a minute. If your child deals with anxiety or OCD, it's likely you've tried any number of strategies to help them, but If you're still struggling, we're launching a new program that may be just what you've been looking for. It's called SPACE, Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions. It's a parent-based program that helps parents help their kids with anxiety, obsessive compulsive thoughts, and other related problems. SPACE was developed by Dr. Ellie Leibowitz at the Yale Child Study Center. SPACE really is teaching the parent how to be supportive and teaching the parent how to recognize and reduce their accommodations. And clinical trial research from multiple studies indicates that it's a very efficacious way of treating anxiety and OCD. And so uh, I think that can be a very helpful resource for, for a lot of families. This podcast parent organization, the Neurodiversity Alliance, has agreed to be a space-trained provider, and we are now taking registrations for a limited number of spots that are available. Follow the link in the show notes or go to neurodiversity.university and click the link. It's a proven tool to help parents help their kids. What are some of the things, some of the factors that you feel like parents need to consider when they think about raising gifted children? So, primary things that kind of rise to the top that are really important for parents of gifted kids to understand or be aware of. Yeah. So one right off the bat is the, the asynchronous development, that asynchrony, that unevenness in their development. That's, that's there. It's, it's there for gifted kids. Something is not consistent with their chronological age. They've been identified as gifted. So say an intellectual ability, you know, that, that would indicate that their abilities are above their chronological age. Uh, as far as, you know, their other abilities, they may be very typical. You may have that, you know, six-year-old who can talk to you like they're an attorney, but they can't tie their shoes yet. Um, you know, those things happen. Those, those, that asynchrony and development, asynchronous development is huge in terms of parenting and raising our gifted kids because it, parents can then fall into the trap of, oh, they talk so well that when they act their age and have a tantrum like a kid their age would, that that doesn't seem right, but it is right. And Mm -hmm. and so, you know, that's certainly one piece. I I think another aspect is, is recognizing what giftedness is and and what it isn't Mm. and recognizing what it means to them and helping them use that as a framework to understand who they are. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Like about what giftedness is and what it isn't? Yeah. So I often use the, the analogy of left-handedness. You know, I was, I was asked crowds when I speak, how many of you are left-handed and you know, and there's very few of us, unfortunately. But when I grew up as a left-handed person, there were certain things that that I couldn't do well. I could not, uh, you know, I could not slice things well. I could not cut well. I could not pour punch, things like that. And the explanation that was given to me as a young child was that I was clumsy. And I believed that explanation. It wasn't until I did my dissertation on left-handedness that I learned that it's not necessarily clumsy. I, you know, scissors are made for right-handed people. Knives are beveled to compensate, or at least they used to be, for the, the angle of a right-handed person's cut. Ladles have a lip on the side to make it easier for a right-handed person. So left-handed people had to do those things backwards or not well. And so I had a different explanation eventually. So for gifted kids, I think it's important uh, that they understand, you know, they they very frequently know from a very young age that they are different. Mm-hmm. And giving them that understanding of why that they are different, uh, giving them 
the opportunity to understand that giftedness influences a lot of areas, and maybe that's part of why they feel different, will give them a positive framework so that they don't necessarily believe the first explanation that's given to them, like they're weird, they're stupid, or there's <laughs> something wrong with them. Um, so that's something that I think parents of gifted kids need to understand is that, that it's a part of who they are. Now, what is the giftedness? What does that mean? So we talk about different areas and types of giftedness. There's, there's intellectual giftedness, academic giftedness, creativity, visual and performing arts uh, giftedness. So all different types of giftedness that are there. But sometimes parents will actually underestimate how bright they think their kids are because they will say things like, they're smart, but they're not that smart. Um, because they may be equating giftedness with, you know, like Albert Einstein or or their grades, like if their grades don't match align with it. Sure. In those situations, for sure. Yeah, they're smart, but they're getting C's or something of that nature. Right. So yeah, that's that's true as well. But you know, so they may miss they may not understand what it is. And and so kind of understanding that yes, these kids are advanced in certain areas, but it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, oh, my kids, yeah, sure, my kid's doing, you know. N knows their alphabet at three, but they're not doing calculus, so they can't be gifted. Well, that's mm -hmm. a that's a different level of calculus, uh, or a different level of giftedness. I mean, so, um, but yeah, so it, it, it's kind of understanding the differences and understanding that yes, they're advanced, but they don't necessarily have to be doing calculus in fourth grade to be identified as gifted. So, from what you were just saying, it sounds like you would suggest or advocate for parents or teachers talking to their kids about being gifted and going ahead and giving them that label? Or is there nuance to that? Does that depend on situations? I think in general, um, it, it is important to, to talk with them about being gifted. Now, some parents don't like that word gifted and are not comfortable with it. And I am absolutely fine with not uh, using that word. You can use different words, quick learner, you know, smart or whatever, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But yes, I'm a big fan of, of helping kids understand that um, I helped write the, the National Association for Gifted Children tip sheet on talking to your kids about giftedness. I think that's a really important thing. Now, this is where we where I always put in the caveat. So there are some people out there that say you shouldn't tell your kids they're smart mm. because that will foster the fixed mindset. If you tell them that they're smart, mm -hmm. back to what I said earlier. I think it's important for them to know that they're smart so that they have that explanation for being smart and why they're different. So they have that explanation for why they're different. Mm -hmm. And I think if you do it in the right way, you can still foster the, the, you know, the right work habits and not lead to that, oh, I'm smart. So I have to pretend that nobody will know I'm not as smart as they think I am mm -hmm. kind of challenges that go along with that, that idea of fixed mindset. Yeah, that's a good point. When we start talking about fixed and growth mindsets related to kids who have a lot of you know high ability, it also really kind of brings home the point that it's really important for them to be challenged and, and the value of being in an appropriate educational setting. Indeed. Having that experience is really important. I always throw out the old uh, joke, riddle, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Where's the only place you can find success before work? It's in the dictionary unless <laughs> you're a, an elementary gifted kid because they find a lot of success without a lot of work mm -hmm. uh, in some situations. And that doesn't really help uh, them understand the importance of work, the importance of connecting what they do with how it turns out. And that's a really big part of being successful because like, no matter how smart you are, you're going to hit a wall at some point. Mm -hmm. As the chemistry professor told me, it's organic chemistry for most <laughs> people. But somewhere you hit that wall. It could be third grade, sixth grade, ninth grade, twelfth grade. But you've, there, there will come a time when you do have to put in effort to be successful. And if you haven't done that for 16 years of school, and you're in, you know, and you're in medical school now, and you have to put in the effort, it, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. So finding that connection early on, finding out, understanding how to work um, is really, really important. And, and the only way we're going to do that is by stretching, by challenging, by getting kids to do things they don't think they can do, having them recognize that they can succeed at something they didn't think they could. Yeah, That's where they really build the confidence. That's where they really build that work habits. How do you feel like the awareness of giftedness and high ability and the support that we give both kids and adults are we making progress in this area, like as a field in a broad sense? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, too. So I would say that uh, when I started in this field, uh, Jim Webb, one of the first things he said to me is, here, you're going to read this book and, and this book and this book and all these other books. Um, but you'll notice throughout the course of these books, there's a lot of myths about gifted kids. And part of what we're doing is trying to correct those myths. 
And he said, what I can say now is that there still are a lot of myths. They're not as prevalent as they used to be, um, but they're still there. Mm -hmm. And I think 33 years later, I could say the exact same thing. There's still some myths out there. They're not as prevalent as they used to be, but we are still fighting an uphill battle um, because gifted kids' needs arise from their strengths. So people don't recognize them as needs. Yeah. And so in those situations, they'll do fine. Everything's going to be okay. And, and, and everybody can point to some kid who, you know, did fine, mm -hmm. you know, without anything. And there are a lot of parents out there like, well, I suffered through it and I made it through. So, you know, uh, why, why, sh you know, why should we make it easier for my kid? <laughs> so, um, I don't know about that one, but, uh, <laughs> but there's some, some parents who, you know, are like, well, you know, I made it. Look, I turned out okay. Yeah. And they're right. They did. They turned out fine, you know. Uh, but if there's a way to make life easier, if there's a way to make life Easier, easier is probably not the right word because I'm not talking about, you know, making it a cakewalk. I don't want kids to go through life without ever experiencing frustration because that's clearly not, you know, not healthy either. Mm -hmm. But I want to, you know, if there's a way to meet their needs better, right, that's yeah. the best way to say it, that we can make the path not so arduous. They can use their strengths and develop the talents in a positive way and feel good about it along the way their needs arise from their strengths. That really is the paradox advocating for gifted kids that we have to kind of wrap our heads around. Those needs are, are just as important and deserve just as much support. Yes, absolutely. Gifted kids are as far away from average as the kids who have mild and functional mental disabilities are from average. Nobody doubts the number and, and necessary supports that those kids need. But gifted kids are just as far above average and they have just as many needs, different needs, but doesn't mean that they don't have needs. They're just as far from average. Um, and, and finding a way to meet those needs is challenging. And doing it in an equitable way, you know, adds another layer um, that fortunately we are paying attention to now, where for many years we unfortunately did not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that finding ways to do that will... Um, you know, will only enhance. But you've seen the articles. Taking away gifted services is not necessarily going to make things more equitable. You know, uh, years ago we had the uh, no child left behind, and uh, unfortunately, in some cases, that it, that that also ended up being no child gets ahead. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how do we how do we meet these kids' needs and 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 finding a way to provide opportunities for all kids? who need them to get services, to be able to challenge themselves, to be able to reach their potential. No school I've ever visited has a, has a uh, mission statement that says we're striving for all kids to be mediocre. <laughs> they all say we're striving for, you know, reaching potential. We we're, we're want these kids to succeed. That's what we're going for. And, and the only way we can do that is to, to understand all learners' needs at whatever level they are and meet those. Well, this is an awesome conversation. I know we've had lots of chances for conversations, and I know we'll have lots more. But I have one last question for you today as we wrap up. If you were talking to a parent who has just found out that their child has been identified as gifted or twice exceptional, what's the one thing that you would want them to hear? What, what's the one thing that you would want to share with them as they begin this journey? I'm going to need a minute on that one. That's really the one thing. So, hmm. What I want them to know is that a gifted kid needs time. They need time to be a kid. They need time to be a gifted kid. And they need time to be a gifted learner. And sometimes those times will overlap. And sometimes they won't. Sometimes they're just going to be a kid and have fun doing kid things. And that's okay. And sometimes they're going to be a gifted kid who's out there doing gifted kid things with other gifted kids and having a great time. And sometimes they're gonna be that gifted learner who is diving into something so deeply that they need assistance from somebody who's you know, at a much higher level of ability. And we want to make sure that they have all those times. We want to make sure that the kids can experience all of those things. And we want the parents to be able to enjoy that ride and not just remember those challenging times when they're arguing with you about something that is so ridiculous, <laughs> but you find yourself stuck in the middle of that power struggle. So we want to have all those times uh, and, and enjoy, the, enjoy the journey, but know that it'll also have its challenges and bumps along the way. 
Dr. Ed Amond, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Well, thanks for having me. This was great. It's been a pleasure working with you. They always say that children don't come with a manual. However, they also always have a lot to say about how we should parent our kids and what we should expect from them. Neurodivergent kids, including gifted children, often don't follow these axioms. So parents are trying to figure out what their kids need and how to support them, often from a place of isolation because their kids' needs are different than the other kids in the neighborhood or on their Facebook feed. A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children is a work that's meant to help parents understand that they aren't alone, to know that their child's asynchronous development is normal, and to help raise them to be happy, gifted adults. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Young, and we didn't want to be exposed, even though it was cold. Always trying to be cool, trying to be those bad guys Smoking cigarettes behind the school Always trying to be cool, trying to be those bad guys, you know This episode is brought to you by SPACE, Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions, a program for parents with children and adolescents who experience anxiety, OCD, and related problems. Check the link in the show notes for details and to register. Thanks to Ed Amand. For information about him, just hit up our episode page or show notes. And also, don't forget you can get 25% off the newly revised A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children by using the coupon code and link in the show notes as well. Lots of new information in the new edition. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our production assistant and office manager is Krista Brown. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. And for all of us, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a production of the Neurodiversity Alliance.